So it's preparing now. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our second episode of the Grapevine Live Show. I am so happy that you're here. I'm Melissa Merkel. I am a personal trainer and health coach and the director of partnerships and business development at Muscle Mix Music. And we have such a great episode today. I'm so excited. My friend Rachel Lavin is here and she is going to be talking about her new book, The Donut Diaries, a personal trainer's tale of being every size from 12 through zero, which I love that title. And Rachel will talk about that in a few minutes. For all of you, again, welcome. So, so happy that you are here and we're gonna get through a lot today. So not only are we gonna talk about what is in the book, but we're gonna talk about how to write a book because I know many of you out there, you probably, or at least at some point have thought about writing your first book. I know I am one of those people and <laughs> I don't know where to start. And so since Rachel's here, we're going to pick her brain a little bit. So Rachel, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Melissa. I am so excited for this conversation. I've been like thinking about it all night and all morning. So I'm really happy to be here too. Yes. Awesome. Me too. I, I'm so excited to like dive into all of this. So Rachel, I know that you have been in the fitness industry for a long time and I know your story a little bit, but why don't you share a little bit about your, your background in fitness and how you got started and, and all of the things about you. Of course, of course. Well, I, um, have always loved movement. So when I was a kid, I ice skated, I did gymnastics, I danced, I was on a swim team. So as I grew up, that didn't really seem far-fetched for me to kind of want to be in the fitness industry. I just didn't really know how. Uh, so I ended up moving very young to, I originally from California, I ended up moving to the Northwest where I'm sure we all remember Bowflex, right? So I ended up working a temp job as an admin for the call center. And so my desk was like right there in the call center. And so people would buy this home gym and, you know, it was the call center's job to answer fitness questions. And so I'm, you know, listening to this all day long and just thinking this doesn't seem so personal. This doesn't seem right. This doesn't feel well, you know, welcoming. Like, I, I don't want to do this. You know, I want someone there with me to help me. And um, so long story short, I found a one year certification program at Portland Community College, which was called fitness technology. And that just encompassed, you know, it was, it was like a preparatory course for the ACE certified trainer, personal trainer exam. But as I was in the program, they decided, well, let's turn it into a two-year degree. So I ended up getting an AAS degree from Portland Community College. So that's how I got my start. Awesome. That is such a fun story. Like who would have thought working in like a call center would lead you into fitness? But it, yeah. it sounds really, really cool. All right. So, so you got certified, you got your degree, and then what, what came next for you? Did you dive in like full speed ahead or, or tell us what happened next? Sure. So during school, even though I did mention it was a two-year degree, it took me a little longer to graduate and earn my degree um, for a, a few reasons, but. Um, it takes us all longer than we expect. Yeah, correct. <laughs> So during college, I was doing group X. I was teaching aqua aerobics at 24 hour fitness. I was also teaching jazzercise. I don't know if anyone here knows what that is, but it's a dance aerobics program. It's and still actually really popular. We yeah. talked to them not too long ago and they are still like going full speed ahead. So oh yeah, for sure. I, uh, my mom lives in Tucson, Arizona. So when I go visit her, I go with her to her jazzercise classes and it's still so much fun, you know, so much fun. Um, yeah. So that's what I did, uh, while I was in school. 
But the minute I graduated and, and got certified, I started working at a gym in Portland, which is called, was called, unfortunately, it no longer exists, Club Sport. And um, I worked there for a full year to kind of get my nerve ready and to get, because uh, my, my dream was to go live in New York City. And so um, I did that for a year until I felt like I was ready. And then I just went for it. I was by this time, 35, 36. I went to college a little later in life, just FYI. I know the math didn't work out, but anyway, so I went back to college and graduated and then moved to New York in 2007, where I have been a personal trainer um, since, yeah. That is awesome. First of all, congratulations on like making that dream a reality because moving to New York is not an easy thing to do. It's super, super scary. So kudos to you for making that happen. Thank you. In (laughs) all honesty, though, I totally cried every single day for the first six months because you're right. It was so scary and it was so hard. But You know, once I finally found my groove, I found an apartment, I finally found a job that I liked, started to make some friends, but it took six months. Yeah. Yeah. Big transition. All right. So tell us what led to writing the book then. How did that come about from all of this? Well, I remember when I was a teenager, I mean, you know, as we'll talk, you know, today and, you know, uh, delve in more. I've had body issues my entire life. You know, I loved movement, but I never could put the connection between food, my body, and the movement. It just all seemed so separate as I was growing up. So I remember as a teenager, I was thinking, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels this way. And I, would start to write and I would start to write. And I don't know if you know much about Sagittarius's, but we're super procrastinators. And every time I would pick up a pen, it would just, you know, it just didn't, it, it was never a follow through kind of thing. And so I spent, you know, my whole life battling with this feeling of just never having the right body. And again, my title itself, I have been every size from a 12 to a zero and everything in between, and nothing has felt right. But um, I don't want to move too far ahead, but you know. No, go ahead. Okay, well, the truth is, is that, you know, once you kind of realize that it's a me problem, yes, we all have it, but how I feel about my body has everything to do with me. So once I kind of sat in that and realized that the only way this is ever going to change is to deal with why I feel this way. Mm -hmm. So back to kind of your original question. So I just always kind of had this idea in me that I knew I wanted to write it. I really had a message that I wanted to share. And during COVID, it just all the things aligned and all the assistance and the help from the universe that I needed to make it a reality just happened. And so that's how I took advantage of our lockdown and I wrote my book. (laughs) That's awesome. You used it to your advantage. I I think it's fantastic because so many fit pros and people, especially women in general, they, they struggle with body image issues and all of the things that you talk about in this book. And as I mentioned at the beginning, like the the part of the title that is talking about the personal trainer's tale of being every size, like 12 through zero. I I get that because I've been there too. I've been all of those sizes. And, and what brought me into the fitness industry 20 years ago was battling with an eating disorder and, you know, trying to figure out all of, all of the body issue things. And the more I talk to other fit pros, the more I hear the same issue with eating disorders and disordered eating and, and all of the things that go along with that. And the first chapter in your book, let, let's dive into that. So the first chapter is called dieting, restricting, and binging. Oh my. And I think that, well, again, I think so many of us can relate to that, especially in this world, whether whether we've dealt with it personally or our clients do, 
it affects so, so many of us. So tell us a little bit about your story when it comes to restricting your food intake and, and all of those things. Okay. Well, I appreciate you sharing, you know, a little bit of your story too, because as I'm doing this and I'm doing more and more podcasts and meeting more amazing women like you, it's like our stories aren't that far apart. You know, I mean, they might have gone this way or that way, but you know, we've all had this experience where we just didn't feel like we were in the right body and tried everything under the sun to change that. So, you know, I grew up in the eighties and nineties where there was literally a fad diet once, you know, something new every week. And trust me, I tried them all. I even went back to, you know, I tried slim fast a thousand times. Oh yeah. And, what, um, what was your favorite flavor? Do you remember? Oh my, well, when I was doing it, it was still like chocolate, strawberry and vanilla. That was yeah. It. Just the three, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I totally. think I, I was always a chocolate person, maybe yes, chocolate, always chocolate. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, this is so fun because it's so true. I know we can all like in solidarity be like, yeah, I did that too. But so it was ingrained into my mind as a young lady, as a teenager, as a young woman, and even up into my forties that when you want to lose weight and you want to be skinny, you have to restrict. You have to cut out this, 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 and this, and that's the only way to achieve, you know, a tiny body. And so that's how I lived my life until it got to be so much, or there was a stress in my life. Like I was divorced early. I moved a lot. Like anytime there was a stressor in my life, I would just say, forget this and go for the pasta, go for the bread, go for everything that I never allowed myself to eat. And then of course, because there's stress in your life, workouts aren't a priority, and then food, and it just becomes this horrible, horrible, vicious circle that I'm sure many of your listeners have repeated just like myself. So when I made the decision when I turned 40, and we'll talk about this a little bit more too, because it wasn't just like one decision and I was healed, but it was, it was a monumental experience for me that made me realize that Everything I was saying, everything I was thinking about my relationship to food was just not true. And it just was doing more damage than it could ever do good. So I write this in my book and I can, I'm, I promise you, I will, I will never lie about this. Once I stopped restricting, I have not binged in about seven years. I just haven't. I haven't. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. And I was actually going to ask you like how, how you stopped binging, because I think a lot of people, when they're in that cycle, it's like, you don't know how to get out. You don't know how to stop it. So for you, you just gave up the restrictions and it became a more natural way of eating. Is that, is that right? Yes. Again, this is obviously much more involved than just that, but that oh, is, for sure. that is the foundation of what my message is like when you start to believe that food is your friend food is fuel all these foods that we grew up believing were bad it's just a thing it's a thing i mean a salad and a ho-ho are both food groups right but what do you eat more of to feel good and again that is my message too it's like yeah I can eat McDonald's every single day I can eat donuts every single day but how am I going to feel it's even like past how am I going to look how am I going to feel right so I'm hoping to get that message across very clearly of course I love donuts of course who doesn't? But I also love salad too. But more importantly than anything, Melissa, I love to feel good. I love to wake up every morning and have energy and feel like I could do anything today. So yeah. That makes so much sense. And you bring up a good point too. Like there's all sorts of different restrictions and there will be some sort of health claim, like you should eat this and you shouldn't eat that. Right. And then the next year, there's going to be some other research <laughs> done that tells you the opposite. And then the year after that, it's going to be something else. And so even if you try to be the most educated person on nutrition topics, even yeah. there's so 
there's so much back and forth and it's always changing. So what I have learned and I'm still learning is how to listen to your body, (laughs) not listen to what everyone else is telling you to do, but really be mindful, pay attention to what feels good in your body and what doesn't and get more of what does feel good. So absolutely. I mean, if that is the one thing that your listeners leave with today, that the more you pay attention to, you know, how you're feeling, despite whatever it is you're putting in your body, that is the real, um, you know, message of how we can get past these things about how we feel about how we look so much, or, you know, am I too heavy? Am I too thin? I I mean, I'm sure the thoughts that go through people's heads are endless, and I can't even begin to name them all. But, you know, the truth is, like, we all just want to be happy, right? And I'm realizing, as I'm getting older, that I'm getting smarter in that sense where, you know, you hear all these really positive affirmations, but I, I think that a lot of it is missed on the fact where it's like, we still have to deal with our day-to-day lives. You know, I can wake up grateful every day and I do, but that doesn't mean that moving to a new state wasn't stressful. Do you, you know what I mean? So And all those things that we experience in our life can cause rifts in our routine, which cause, you know, rifts in how we are eating for temporarily or how we're moving our body temporarily. So I just feel like the more that we are in tune with our bodies, that those transitions in life become much easier to handle. Mm. I think that's so good. And you mentioned something when you were talking there too, about like all of the thoughts about all of the things. And I think, and I know so many people, and I've been there myself too, all of the mental drama going on in your head about how do I look in this? How do I look in that? Oh, is my like, you know, what's sticking out here? Or should I eat that? No, I shouldn't eat that. Like there's so much mental drama about our bodies and what we're supposed to be putting in them or or shame or guilt for what we have put in them. And it's like, if we didn't have all of those thoughts, what what would we be thinking about? How much better could we serve the world? Like, I feel like I've wasted decades of my life just being lost in all of those thoughts and not actually contributing anything worthwhile. (laughs) Well, I hear what you're saying. And I too have had that epiphany, but you know what, how else? were you going to get to where you are now if you didn't experience that? So, you know, you can look at it that way too. Um, And, you know, you can change your mindset moving forward now, you know, and you can, and you can do all those things, which you are. I mean, look at what you're doing today. You're doing this podcast in hopes to help other, you know, men and women. So you're, you're doing it. That is a very good way of looking at it. All right. So I know, and the favorite, my favorite chapter in here um, is chapter three, when you're talking about when you turn 40, that's when you really started to love yourself. And so I really want to dive into this topic because I think, and I had a conversation with one of my friends not long ago about self-love and how to love yourself because it sounds a little like woo-woo and like, it sounds all like pie in the sky, but how do you actually like take the steps when you've had so many thoughts that are negative about yourself, like how do you go from that to self-love? So I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey because I know, like you said earlier, it's not like a, like, you know, you just decide and you're done and you're good and you love yourself and, you know, you stop restricting and life's good. Like it's not that easy. So, so tell us a little bit about what that looked like for you. Of course. So to give your audience some perspective, my, you know, awakening happened at 40 and I'm 50 now. So we're, we're still learning, right? We're still, we're still learning. Um, I mean, it's not a pretty story, unfortunately. I mean, I was in a very unhealthy relationship and I realized after that relationship ended, I had no freaking idea how to be alone. I had no idea how to enjoy my own company. I had no idea who I was and how much um, I depended on other people to fill those voids, right? Um, 
And again, we talk about the universe and not everyone has to believe this. It's my, it's my belief. Okay. So I was, um, I don't even know how it came into my possession, but a book called The Untethered Soul by Michael A. Singer. It's so good, isn't it? I read it not long ago. Yes. And it, it, I mean, it changed my life because it was what I needed to hear at that moment, but I was also ready because I was tired of feeling tired. I was tired of feeling like I wasn't in the right body. I was tired of feeling all these things. So that book really kind of helped me figure out that, you know, I needed to kind of take charge a little bit. And so the best thing that, and I thank New York City for this and I will for the rest of my life, it is the perfect city to be single in. And I just started taking myself out on dates. I started going to the Met and I started going to, you know, shows at Radio City Music Hall. And I didn't even ask anyone if they wanted to come. I wanted to do these things by myself. And the more comfortable I started getting, I started, you know, opening up to more change and blah, blah, blah. And just feeling like I can do this, you know? And, you know, believe it or not, the whole restriction thing came a few years later. But I think that the path was made available to me because I started to love myself. The body thing came a little later, but um, yeah, I will always be grateful to New York to teach me how to kind of be an adult. It was really nice. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. so good. And that book is amazing. It's, it's so, it's so so good. So that, that's that's awesome. I recommend it to anyone who just wants to kind of understand, like you were talking about, all that chatter that goes on in our heads every day. It's like you can learn to quiet it. You know, you really can. So it's a great book. I agree a hundred percent. The untethered soul in case you missed it the first time we said it. <laughs> and it's on audiobook too. If you don't like to read. <laughs> I'm sure that it is. And it's not a long book either. I mean, it's kind of yeah. short. So, yeah. so yeah. it's awesome. Nice. So let me ask you, um, because in my search for, for self-love and and what that is like, I sometimes, and I try to do it when I'm home by myself, but will stand in front of the mirror and say out loud, I love you today because, and then fill in the blank. Have you ever done an exercise like that? Like where you've actually kind of said to yourself what you love about yourself? I do it every day. (laughs) I mean, I think that, you know, with everything that was going on in here that was so negative for so long you have to be proactive in changing that mentality and saying kind things to yourself I mean I again I apologize if I'm jumping ahead but that was part of my issue is that it didn't matter (laughs) what I was doing or who I was with you better believe I found a way to say something negative about my body or you know, if I hadn't seen someone for a long time, I'm like, please don't, I know I'm fat. Like they didn't even like get a chance to hug me and say, hi. It was like, I know I'm fat, you know? So to uh, unlearn or to relearn a new behavior, it does take things like that. And you kind of have to suspend all that stuff that you're like, oh my God, this is so dumb. But every morning I'm like, I love you. You know, even because again, I have lived in that hateful body for over 40 years. So I still have my days, you know, to be honest, Melissa, I still have my days where I put on something. And my first thought is I want to say, don't put on black, just (laughs) put something black on. But even today, I was like, nope, today we're doing the pink top. Okay. I am going to um, do it and I'm going to be happy about it. And I'm not going to think about it again. So I still have to have those conversations with myself. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's really powerful that you, like every morning you say positive things, like you practice those thoughts that you want to have because they don't come naturally when what has come naturally for so long are the other thoughts. So I I think that's really powerful. And for anyone that is listening that has never tried, try it, like stand in the mirror and say out loud, I love you. And then why? I remember the first time I did it, like, of course I felt like kind of weird 
um, yeah. doing it, but it was so powerful. Like it brought tears to my eyes because it was like, most of us never think about that or yeah. even recognize sometimes that there is something to love and there always is uh -huh. There's so much amazing goodness in everyone. So. Absolutely. And I think, you know, a lot of us are ingrained to look for that in a man or look for that in a partner or look for that in our career. And, you know, I think when women say you can have it all, I do believe that, but I believe it is, you know, when it comes from a place of self-love, you know, you can't use all those things to fill that void, but if you love yourself and you trust yourself, because I have to be honest, to me, those things are, you know, parallel. You have to trust and love yourself. Um, then you can have all the things and really enjoy them and, and have a fulfilled, happy life. And I think that's our goal, right? All of us want to be happy, but I don't think, and myself included, again, I never want to come across like I'm shaming anybody because I'm still, I'm still learning. We're but, all a work in progress. Yeah, absolutely. Always. But if you realize that it takes work to be happy, you know, there, I, I just think that that makes the job <laughs> so much more enjoyable. Yeah, for sure. And I think too, that, that we all strive for happy and I think that's good, but it's okay to not be happy sometimes too. And there are situations that are sad and to have the, the emotion or the reaction of, of happiness is not actually what you want. And so being okay with that balance as well, but knowing that yeah, your, your fulfillment, your self-love, your having it all comes from the inside. It doesn't come from any external thing or person or anything like that. I think, I think you bring up really good points. So, yeah. And just to add one more thing to that, yeah. I think that if you, what you said is so true, but I think in the beginning stages, when you're trying to find your happy, that can almost derail someone. So mm -hmm. for me, I know that life happens and I am sad sometimes too, but that doesn't mean that happy isn't like right there. I'm sad right now, but I'm happy in the long run, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. For sure. So what would you say is your like overall like goal or mission with writing the book? What do you hope comes out of it? Um, and what do you see your future looking like? That is a great question. I see myself being an advocate to as many men and women as possible. And I've realized in doing this for a while now that <clears throat> yes, women, you know, it's almost like we grow up and we hate our body, right? But it does affect men too. Let's be real. So Absolutely. I just want to be an advocate for people and to eradicate the word fat from our vocabulary. And I don't know how I'm gonna do that yet, but I just think in having conversations with amazing women like you and having more people join the conversation. And I'm, again, as long as I know that I am always gonna be learning through this whole process and not to be like in a box like I used to be and just have an open mind because I'm already learning that body positivity doesn't necessarily mean um, body love or self-love, you know? So I'm still, I'm starting to figure this out that you can be on social media and showing your body all you want. And that's great. Love your body. Love it. Love it. I, that's great. That's not me. <laughs> okay. I can't. No, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. I don't want to do that because that's not who I am. I'd rather talk to you. I'd rather sit in a room with you or sit here with you and have a conversation than pose in a bikini, but that's just me. So that for me, there's a difference there. Body love, body positivity. Mm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Cause I, I have a hard time, I, I guess, fully understanding the difference. So, well, <laughs> I'm still learning the difference too, but I think yeah. you know, there is a hashtag out there. It's like body positivity. And what I'm seeing, just what yeah. I'm seeing is that women are trying to make, you know, flaws in our body normal, which of course 
absolutely. Yeah. But is your message really teaching a young girl who thinks she's fat and needs to go on a diet at eight o'clock that or eight, eight years old, that your jiggly thighs or your saggy boobs are what she needs to see or hear? For me, that's the disconnect. And um, again, please, I am not chastising any woman who's comfortable doing that. I'm already saying I'm not, but I think there's, it needs to go a little deeper. You know, it needs to go like, where did you learn to hate your body? Why do you hate your body? Was it one thing that happened to you that traumatized you? Was it something you heard, something happened to you? It's deeper than that for body love and self-love to me. To mm-hmm. me. Interesting. I think that there's so much room for so much discussion around this yeah. topic and all of those things, because we see it a lot, especially within the fitness space, you know, people showing off their bodies and, mm-hmm. and where that comes from as well, because I think the, the reason why, or the underlying, you know, motivation for doing that, um, just brings about a lot of conversation. And I, I think that having discussions like this and just opening it up so that there is a safe space to talk about it, because I don't necessarily know that anyone's right or wrong when it comes to all of this, you know, but to be able to hear each other out and understand what's going on and, and then being able to choose what we feel most comfortable with, I think is really important. So absolutely, I, I think absolutely. we're going to actually be hearing a lot more about all of this. You know, last month I had Christine Conti and Carly Taylor on, and we were talking yeah. about eating disorders and disordered eating and, and all of those things. And so I think we're as an industry, but just as, as humans kind of getting more comfortable, being able to have these discussions and, and talk about it and, and not trying to hide behind anything that's going on for any of us or finding shame in it, but connect other people and, and being vulnerable to actually have the conversation. So, so thank you for everything you are doing to, to open that conversation up because it does affect so many of us so deeply as well. So, all right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how the book actually came about. So you had mentioned that you started writing a number of times and then kind of procrastinated or, you know, maybe stopped. So did you always know this is what you wanted to write about? Or when you started writing, did you have maybe like other topics or how did you get really clear on your message? That is a great question. Um, so to answer from prior attempts, no, I didn't always know that I wanted to write about this particular topic. I did know that it was always going to be my story. Um, I, and I, you know, my intention was always to help people. I just mm-hmm. didn't know what part of my story was really valuable, you know? And I think, and I do say this in the book, I, I always thought writing about the successes, right? My first when I really got serious about it, it was like how I lost the weight and kept it off, right? Yeah. But that didn't last. <laughs> I mean, the weight came back. So I was like, well, there goes my idea. But I didn't realize how important it was going to be to write about the failures and, you know, the successes and the failures and to just really that I'm human and I was trying to be in this tiny, tiny body for all of the wrong reasons. And, um, you know, there's a lot of science about our bodies and, you know, set points and this and that. I'm not a doctor, not a nutritionist. So, but I believe that, you know, and my set point has always been, you know, where my body is now. I can get skinny. I can, I've obviously been a size zero, but do you know what I have to do to stay that way? I mean, it's torture. It's torture. And so again, when I realized, hey, let's just be happy, that came, that whole idea of me and my size zero body 
had to fall by the wayside. It just had to because those two ideals were conflicting and they just weren't gonna, they weren't gonna meet up anywhere. So when I finally decided that I was going to write this book for real, again, the universe stepped in and handed me all the tools that I needed to do it. But the idea was that I did not want to, um, I lost my train of thought, I'm so sorry, that it wasn't just going to be a success story. It was going to be the story about my successes and my failures and where I'm at now. And with a clear message that this lesson isn't over. I'm still, you know, I'm still learning new things every day. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what were, other than starting to write, like what were the first steps that you took or what are the first steps that if, you know, if someone wanted to start and actually have a book come out, like what are the first steps that they should take? Sure. So what I would recommend is, you know, just write, just write. Don't worry about punctuation or grammar or sentence structure or anything. Just get your idea out on the page or the screen, whatever. And, you know, while you're doing that, research um, publishing companies. Now, you can publish a book so many ways that I've learned. There's self publishing. There's, you know, going through publishing houses and then there's doing what I did. And I used a publisher, but my book is called Print on Demand. And what the beautiful thing about this process that I used was I was able to speak my story on the other line to someone. Then they transposed everything that I said and gave me you know, a first draft, a manuscript, if you will. The process is very expensive, but it is like someone is literally holding your hand through this entire process. And so from conception to, you know, the live book that you're holding there took about a year. Okay. That's yeah. great to, to have that yeah. timeline. So, yeah. all right. So you mentioned that you just start writing. When you started, like, did you have an outline? Did you like try to organize stuff or did you just like get all of the ideas out and then kind of organize it later on? How did that piece come about? So that's a great question. So when I use this particular publisher, it's called the You Speak It program. So the I had, speak it? Week, yeah, I had six weeks of phone calls with a woman. And so we had already, um, you know, my first task was I had to create an outline. I had to create my five chapters and we would build upon that. So like week one was my first chapter one. And she's like, just talk, just talk, just tell me your story. And so for six weeks, we did that because after, um, you know, then you do your conclusion and all the other fun stuff. And so after that time period, they take about a month or two to deliver the entire manuscript to you. I read it, I was not, I, it wasn't the message I was trying to convey. So I said to them, I said, I need some time with this. And I loved that I had a beautiful foundation, but I started from scratch. Now that I had it and I could see it and I could see what it would look like as a book. And now I had that visual in my mind, you know, I'm, I'm a very visual learner. So that's what I needed to create what is now my book. Interesting. Okay. So you said you started then with you speak it. That's what it was called. Is that? Well, that is from my publisher. That's the name of this particular process. Oh, so okay. I don't know if that's what other publish, because I know there's other publishers that will do this, but that's what okay. they call it. It's called the You Speak It program, which takes the stress of you feeling like you have to do all the work yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it's very overwhelming. Like, it what is, are my going to be? When I yeah. finally had my manuscript and I started from scratch, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to write it. And I went back and forth and back and forth. It took me from the time I got the manuscript back to where I resubmitted it for editing six months that I rewrote it. And there was a lot of delete, 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 retype, 
rereading. And I finally realized that when I read my entire story and there was like, okay, there's nothing else I can change. That's when I knew it was ready. Mm, That's so good. So, all right. So a few things, and I want to make sure that we don't miss anything. So, (laughs) (laughs) all right. So backing up, yeah. Your publisher had this program, the You Speak It thing. So how did you get connected with your publisher? And if someone wanted to like Google something, what would they look for? Because <laughs> yeah, I know you mentioned there's like different ways to publish. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, talk us through like how you actually decided which okay. way you were going to go. Yeah, so it was very simple. I was having a lovely conversation with one of my girlfriends. And we were talking about the whole restriction and stuff like that. And she's like, you really should write a book. And I said, I would love to. I said, but I don't know where a comma, a period, an ex, I just don't know how to do that. And she's like, don't let that stop you. She's like, one of my clients use this publisher. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you two in touch. So we, then this lady, and she wrote a book with them too. It's um, Jen Eden, and she wrote a book about sugar. I, I'm so sorry, Jen, I forgot the name of your book. But um, so she and I had a really lovely conversation and that turned into meeting with the publisher. Um, and this was all over Zoom, you know, this was during 2020, during COVID. And there was just something about him that just made me feel safe and that made me feel comfortable. Because when I went to him with my idea, I said, is this even anything? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, was, I wasn't sure. Yeah. And he's like, yes, he's like, your message is amazing. He's like, we, let's do this. And I had to make the choice to invest in myself and spend the money and, um, and go for it. That's awesome. That's yeah. so good. So do you plan on writing another book? And if so, will you go about like doing it the same way? Like, it sounds like the, you speak it thing was, was helpful to kind of get the foundation laid, but now that you've done it once, like, will you do it different or kind of do it on your own? What are your thoughts or, or would you do? I am open to anything. I mean, I don't think I would need the speak it portion because I am so much more comfortable writing now and I'm blogging and, and learning, you know, where punctuation goes. So I don't think I would need that part of it for a book two <clears throat> or, you know, whatever else I decide. Or three or four, 10, 11. I know, right. Imagine the Stephen King right here. Um, I don't think I would need that portion of it, but in all honesty, I haven't researched a different way to do it, so I don't have an answer for you about that. Mm-hmm. That that makes sense. Yeah. So, if a fit pro came to you and wanted advice on writing a book, what would your your advice be to them? My first question would be is what is it you want your message to do? Do you want to help people or do you just want to sell books? Because if that's the case, honey, (laughs) it's not going to happen because the book is not your money maker. It's what you do with it. That could, you know, that will give you streams of income. So, you know, and Christine will attest to this. It's literally the most expensive business card that you will ever create but it doesn't mean that your message isn't special. So I would, I would ask someone to get real clear on what is your message. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, once that happens, I would say, try writing it yourself and see what happens, but just know that there's all these resources out there in the world that are available to you, that making your dream a reality is totally possible. You know, so I, I mean, again, we talked about this. There's so many ways to publish a book now that, and so many people do it. I didn't realize how many people can say, Hey, I wrote a book. I I just didn't know that before I, before I had done it. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. I think you bring up a really good point too, because I think a lot of people think I'm going to write a book and I'm going to sell millions of copies (laughs) and life is going to be perfect. And, and you do have expenses to actually get it out there. And then having that, the thoughts of what you're going to do with it and how you're going to use it to get your message out there and, you know, whatever it might be, promote your message or your brand or your business. But 
but having that full plan laid out, I think is really important. And so I appreciate that you're bringing that up because I think that that piece can get overlooked a lot because of the excitement of like, Ooh, I want my book, you know, like I want a book. Well, so. and also too, I mean, even after my book was out in the world, like my book has been out available since October of last year. And there was still a little bit of that because the, the excitement of, you know, the whole thing and, and trust me, it did very well. I mean, it's not like I haven't sold any books, but did it instantly catapult me into something that no, but I also know that there was so much more for me to learn and my message needs to get clear with every experience before I can just like stand on, you know, a stage and do a Ted talk and tell them how amazing and how beautiful it is to love your body. Like there's so many steps that I think even for me, who's actually done it now did get a little swept up in the excitement of like having a book out in the world. It's just not an automatic thing. Like you were just mentioning, you know, I'm not an established author, like Mary Higgins Clark or whatever. It's just, I'm, I'm a nobody right now. And that's okay. I have so much to figure out still. First of all, you are not a nobody. I didn't mean to use that word. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm an unknown author. That's what I meant. <laughs> Got it. But you're known to some and yeah. more every day <laughs> because I keep hearing you out and about on all the podcasts and the and shows and, and all of that. And I think it's awesome. And I do think it is exciting. And I think it should be celebrated because yeah. for so many people, this idea get stuck up here forever and for always and never materializes. So I think there is excitement. And I think there is like, you should feel so proud of yourself for getting this out there because it's an amazing accomplishment. So Thank um, you. yeah, so I definitely think the excitement should absolutely be there. And, and yeah, I think your approach of just growing with every step along the way is going to lead to like such massive success and, you know, being able to share your message with so many people, which is exactly what you're doing now. So, so kudos to you and congratulations because you're, you're an inspiration and you're just a wonderful person. So well, thank you. But I also realize, you know, in having this experience is that the beauty is like, you know, when somebody puts a new product out in the world and the buzz is so exciting, and then it just, you never hear about it again. I know that with this book, it's just the beginning. You know, like you were saying, it's just a means to get the message out. And this is a topic that we women and men, but we women have to heal from, from decades and decades. So this topic is not going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah. It's not at all. And I have a feeling it will I don't want to say get worse before it gets better, but yes, there will be conversations and need to be more of them around all of this. So that is so true. So tell everyone where they can find your book, The Donut Diaries. Um, you can purchase it from Amazon or you can purchase it directly from my website, which is rachellavinfitness.com. You can find me on all the social medias under the same Rachel Lavin Fitness. And um, yeah, that's where I am at. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much for being here today and talking about all of this with us. Is there anything else you would like to share with the audience before we sign off? I just want to say that you are not alone. I just want women out there to know that you are not alone. I love that. I love that. Rachel, thank you so much for being here. And for everyone that is watching, whether you're here with us live or you're watching the recording, thank you for taking the time to join in on this conversation. And please reach out to either Rachel or myself. Let's continue this conversation because the more people that are talking about it, the more we can start to create change and, and self-love and body positivity and all, all of the things. So let's keep this conversation going. All right. Thank you, Thanks, Melissa. everyone. Uh, we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.